and you got my picture, everything is clear, right? All right, fair and fine. That we are all here almost that we are waiting for the other people to come. But so we can start with a brief introduction to make sure that we are going to set on track and then we'll continue with more in-depth discussions about the thing that I'm planning to share with you for uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to appreciate all the uh, participants and everyone who has made contribution to make this event possible. And this has been a joint collaboration between all the different parties that you have seen the uh, the logos on the poster. So this has been an international event and we're going to get, get this sort of practices continued as we move because uh, we all believe in that only together we can do things in a better way. So definitely there are much uh, more potential untapped, and untapped in front of us and we're going to do that together. So everyone is welcome to join for further communications just to be nominated as speakers and to help this this initiatives flourish as we proceed. So the thing that uh, I've just been thinking how to communicate the whole concept with you for 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 this session for tonight is that that we are talking about something which is called uh, cognitive neuroscience and behavioral neuroscience and that all relates to the concept of brain health as we all understand and as we all know. The brain health uh, refers to cognitive health and behavioral health and we also have the emotional or effective health and motor sensory you know performance and functionality so putting them all together what we are talking about here is to figure out what a specific neurotechnological approaches we can potentially use to mobilize and also to help the people to be mobilized to a better state of brain health a better state of functionality so we all know that neuromodulation has been the one of the areas of interest in neuroscience and all the research and practical interests for the past uh, couple of decades. So there has been a lot, a plethora of publications over the past like 10, 20 years. And we know that um, some approaches like magnetic electrical, magnetic stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and also uh, uh, like transcranial electrical stimulation and neuromodulation in different aspects. Also, we have some some specific unique ways of uh, mapping the brain function, ranging from uh, e, uh, like quantitative EEG and MEG, and also we have the FNIRS, which is functional near infrared infrared spectroscopy. And we have different imaging modalities that we're using them to functionally have the map functional map of the brain to make sure how the brain functions when when the subject is submitted to a cognitive or a behavioral task. So one of those things that has attracted some attention lately is the uh, the audiovisual entrainment. So the AVE, and we're going to tap into some of the peculiarities about the uh, neuroscience aspects of this and the, the neurophysiological underpinnings that uh, you know kind of justify uh, the, the 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 application of this approach in in clinical applied neuroscience from one side and from the other perspective we got to be thinking and talking and discussing around uh, how research can potentiate uh, further uh, you know uh, possibilities to mobilize and also to to, to enhance the brain function uh, using the AVE and I, I just want to first share my screen with you then we can start talking about the things that I already have prepared to share with you tonight so let's see how that, what that is. All right. Okay. So, so here, I am uh, presenting this communication with you in a brain health institute that we have in in a southern part of Iran in Shiraz that we've been functionally active in the field of neuromodulation and applied neuroscience for the past three, four years. And we also lead the Department of Neuroscience at Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. 
where we're thinking about how to extend the knowledge and practice of neuroscience to society, how we're going to use some non-pharmacological approaches to enhance the neurocognitive function of the people who are coming to our doors. And also education, training, and research are the other pillars that we are focusing on in our practice at our institute and, and our university. So yeah, uh, my name is Mohammed and uh, Mohammed Nami. I'm heading the Department of Neuroscience currently at Shiraz University of Medical Science, and I'm an adjunct faculty at the Neuroscience Center at Indicassets in AIP in Panama City in Panama. So I'm grateful to everyone who is joining today for this communication. I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose and I have not been receiving any honorario from any developers or distributors uh, or technological, you know, sources uh, so far. Uh, the, the kind of thing that we'll be touching on today is uh, preliminarily revolve around, is going to preliminarily revolve around the entrainment technologies. So we got uh, audio entrainments and audiovisual entrainment that will be more touching on the AVE today. And also we'll be discussing about some uh, uh, features of, uh, of autonomic nervous system entrainment because we all know that uh, the nervous system is composed of uh, main two uh, pillars. One is the central nervous system and the second one is the peripheral nervous system. But the PNS per se is divided into somatic nervous system and also autonomic nervous system. For the autonomic nervous system, something which, which really matters is how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are coming into sort of a balance and functional harmony that we have uh, uh, this, this kind of crosstalk between the ANS and CNS. So based on that, we have this control over uh, our behavior or our, our pro data processing and also our uh, you know, motor, sensory, cognitive, emotional, affective performance. So that is like a two-way street, but at the same time we have the PNS and the peripheral nervous system, we, which, which uh, we, we are more focusing on the uh, uh, like musculoskeletal system and also the peripheral, uh, you know, uh, uh, neural dynamics, it, it also plays an important role. And we know that the, the, uh, the autonomic nervous system has a control over the cardiovascular and respiratory and digestive and also urinary and reproductive systems. So it is really critical to uh, make sure that we got this balance between the brain and spinal cord from one side with uh, the autonomic nervous system and also the, the peripheral nervous system. So that's what we're going to touch on as we're uh, going to proceed uh, to, with today's communication. So let's first touch and discuss some ideas regarding uh, the auditory entrainment. So some of us have perhaps heard about the, the CDs or the audio file that they are currently available in the market. Uh, some people have claimed that this sort of you know, audio file is going to help you enhance your brain functionality, your cognitive capacity, or your processing speed, your reaction time, what's, uh, whatever. But uh, we, we got to first understand what could possibly be, be the, the scientific uh, proof and also the, the, the neuroscience underpinning of this kind of claims. Actually, the, the auditory entrainment and the audiovisual entrainment has a long history, but a short past. I mean that only for the past couple of decades, some uh, recent ideas have come into experimental empirical research. And one of the main figures that have contributed a lot to this uh, AVE neuroscience is, uh, um, is David uh, Saver. And David Saver is uh, one of the main uh, you know, contributors to the field. The, the person who is a neuroscientist who has devoted his career to understanding and applying the AVE in the field of applied and clinical neuroscience. So many of these auditory uh, files that we have for meditation, for focus, en enhancement of the focus or attention and memory and so on and so forth are actually uh, influencing the brain waves. 
Some of them are specifically used for the purpose of meditation or mindfulness or relaxation, and some of them are the, the other way around. So they are uh, the kind of, they are inducing the kind of you know uh, mental state that we have the the mind awake and body asleep state. So so what we need to figure out is to know about the components of this. Uh, uh, audio file. So we know that many of them are composed of at, at least two parts. So one of them is the frequency tone, and if the if, if, if the sound is in a high frequency tone or a low frequency, and also if we do have the mask and music, because many of the instances when people are putting at, putting the the headphones and they are listening to this audio entrainment uh, uh, files, they they don't f find it like pleasant, and it's kind of disturbing in some instances. So because of that, and some of the developers of this uh, technologies are making a mask and music in the background to make it more tolerable and pleasant uh, as people are listening to them. Yeah, and those frequencies are matched uh, for the frequency bands uh, within beta or alpha or theta or delta frequency band which, and based on that, the, when, when we are, you know, submitting this specific uh, uh, brain, uh, this specific acoustic wave brain wave, uh, uh, acoustic, uh, you know, frequency bandwidth and, and waves, then the brain is going to get entrained with this a specific frequency band. And by that, we're kind of training and, and, and maybe the better way to put it is like to entrain the brain wave is at, at the acoustic cortex or maybe at the prefrontal level of the brain that uh, it helps the brain to get, you know, adjusted to that a specific way of firing. So the firing frequency and the oscillation pattern will kind of change by time. And we know that in the EEG of the people, uh, when, when they are involved in a task or they are listening to something or they are watching something or they are involved in a task, they have some kind of changes that they might be referring to event-related potentials, event-related changes. So we know that for the auditory stimuli, we have the auditory evoke responses or auditory evoke potential or AEP. And many of you are probably, are probably aware of the typical form and the morphology of the AEP. When we hear the sound of a click, then by this exposure, first the cochlear nerve is going to make the the first uh, you know um, action potential series of action potentials. So by that, the first two deflections will happen, and the first two components of the AEP are originating from the cochlear nerve. And after that, we have uh, the the cochlear nucleus or CN, which is producing the third component of that AEP as a general you know. Uh, a special pattern that we have for the AEP. Afterwards, what we have is an, uh, the fourth part, the fourth component of this AEP or event-related potential when it comes to acoustic stimulus. And that, that is originated from the SOC or superior olivary complex. And then we have the fifth, uh, you see here we have the fifth uh, component which originates from the la lateral lemniscus and also the inferior colliculi. And y this is something that, you know, reproducible. So when we have the repetitive, so when, when someone is presented with as one sound or one click, then we have this AEP as a like stereotypical form of the brain waves and the evoke potentials. And we all know that the brain responds to this sort of Excuse me. We we all know that the brain responds to this sort of brain, uh, to this sort of acoustic stimuli in a consistent way. So if the sounds are like evenly spaced, then they are, we are going to make the frequencies, and the frequencies will be then applied to make uh, brain waves get entrained with those frequencies, right? So yeah, and we we all know that uh, the the acoustic stimuli are in two different sort of uh, categories and two different natures. One of them are as the, 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 the tone, which is referred to as the isochronic tone. And the isochronic tone is, is, a, is an acoustic tone, which is evenly, evenly spaced tone. And it turns on and off quickly. Then it produces a, a very strong evoke response and evoke potential. It is psychologically appealing. People like to listen to those sounds. 
and uh, uh, and this isochronic tones tones are are actually like like they are able and they're, they are potentially capable of making the frequency following response so this isochronic tones are uh, well actually something uh, that to be applied for brainwave entrainments on the other hand when we have the binaural beats the binaural beats are uh, kind of you know uh, more more uh, pleasant to listen to but they are not necessarily capable of inducing the uh, uh, the the frequency following response so the the entrainment is not going to frequently happen happen after the BAB or binaural acoustic beats but instead when we're talking about the isochronic tones that is a different story so for the uh, for the isochronic tones the capacity of making the brain entrainments brainwave entrainment is is way uh, uh, you know more and uh, perhaps you're familiar with the binaural acoustic beats or BABs we know that uh, uh, two different tones that are slightly different in their pitches are being uh, uh, you know uh, introduced to each ear separately and the brain, for example, for the right ear, I'm going to introduce like uh, like 510 hertz tone, and for the left ear, I'm going to introduce like 500 hertz tone. So the the difference and the subtraction of these tones are are like 10 hertz, right? So the brain itself will subtract this 510 hertz tone from this 500 tone, and the brain will get entrained potentially with uh, the subtraction of the difference of the perceived sound. Uh, sound within the head and this is normally known as the phantom sound and this phantom sound sometimes is, is quite relaxing it's it's very nice and pleasant to listen to but as I told before as you're probably aware it is less potential for uh, for making the brain wave entrainment so as we discussed earlier for the binaural beats it's uh, unlikely that we have the significant brainwave ent entrainment but as we all know it, it is it is known to be more hypnotic or relaxing or pleasant to listen to uh, as for the isochronic tones we know that it is strongly entraining uh, yet many of the people don't find it very uh, you know pleasant and it is not easy for them to listen to the isochronic tone because of that we need to we got to have some mask and musics on the background so when we're looking at the body of research that we have for the acoustic beat um, entrainment or the binaural acoustic beat entrainment and also isochronic tone entrainment we we see we, we just come across to many of the papers and studies over the past 20 years many of them are found to be mixed and they're not consistent in terms of the outcome uh, of the research and the results of the studies so many of the studies have been using the BAB rather than the isochronic tone and one of the you know uh, downsides of all those papers that we have uh, uh, you know reviewed lately has been the small sample size and uh, the frequencies are varied so it's it's quite you know hard to make the cross trial comparison to put them all together if you intend to do some sort of a like meta-analysis or systematic review it's pretty hard to discuss all those varied and mixed you know thin body of evidence um, and the, the, the inter-trial differences uh, uh, mostly concern about the varied frequencies which has been submitted one study uses the three hertz whereas the other study is using 10 hertz so uh, some of the studies uh, I, I can say more than half of those studies that we have uh, bumped into and we've been reviewing just recently uh, we have seen that they are using the second single session studies so it is it is still uh, unclear whether this audio visual entrainment specifically uh, audio uh, acoustic entrainment is going to last for long and we would just need to know about the the, the additive effect and the uh, like the putative effect of the session by session uh, you know impact of this um, entrainments we still don't know clearly about that and studies are not really producing enough convincing data about it so the main thing which which attracted our attention first when we were 
you know, reading about the AVE literature, we came across uh, one of the studies that which has been published in 2016 by Icarno in, uh, in Nature. So that was sort of tapping into the effect of AVE or audiovisual entrainment in Alzheimer's model, uh, mice model. And it turns out that the gamma oscillation and the gamma stimulation versus dark control of, uh, of white mice uh, started to induce uh, kind of, you know, uh, differences in microglial body uh, diameter and uh, the dark neurons have been decreased in the number of the apoptotic uh, cells and uh, it has been, uh, you know, decreased and, and the number of the sub surviving cells after the AVE submission to the mice model of Alzheimer's are turned to be increasing even to 166%. So that was, and also the load of uh, the beta amyloid deposition when the, the mice were not uh, sub, uh, submitted to uh, this AVE started to emerge, started to increase. So by that, uh, the uh, authors of that paper concluded that uh, the use of AVE can potentially decrease uh, the, um, the neuroinflammatory processes which eventually lead into uh, the pathophysiological aspects of Alzheimer's disease. And this can in some way, you know, ignite our, our curiosity that perhaps uh, this can be applied to other models and this could be something which eventually uh, may, may provide some benefits for the human, uh, um, you know, models and human subjects. And also when we have uh, neuro, neuropsychological pathologies or neurocognitive predicaments, so perhaps AVE could be of benefit. And when we're looking at different uh, uh, bodies of evidence, we see that, yeah, this uh, rhythmic stimulation uh, has been something which has been uh, well studied and Dave Seaver uh, has been one of the pi pioneers in the field as I said before and uh, in a chapter of a book called Pro Procedures in Neuromodulation we know that yeah we got many effects of the AVEs on brain and mind dynamics so first of all we, we can adjust the brain wave activity and we can some sort of modulate the brain wave frequencies by using the the AVEs number one number two is that when we're having this uh, you know cognitive diffusion when we're going to stay away from the all the distressing worries and we we need to have the the whole brain synchronization either in the band of uh, alpha or theta frequency so by dissociating this uh, you know, cognitive uh, uh, aspects and emotional aspects. So when we have the cognitive emotion dysregulation, when we do the meditation, that's where fair and fine. So people will find it, uh, will find themselves to be on ease. But when they do this um, on uh, and other perspective using the AVE, they subjectively report the same sort of, uh, you know, uh, clinical effect. And also we have the HPA axis. So when we do not have the quite, uh, you know, favorable, like um, vagal tone, and we with the parasympathetic drive is not as as expected. Then by that, the HPE axis is going to be overturned, and by this, the the pr the production and the release of um, you know um, uh, counter-regulatory hormones and also the cortisol from the uh, adrenal gland, also the 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 corticotropin releasing hormones and and stuff like that will get increased. And by this, the upturning of, of the endocrinological, uh, you know, aspects of stress-related uh, phenomena from one side, and also the hampered uh, immunological response of the, of the body may come hand, it may go hand in hand, and the person may find it, you know, distressing when we do not have the capacity of kind of, you know, autonomic uh, calming effect that we have been uh, expecting in the face of some uh, stressful situations. And also we have the increases in, we, we have evidence showing the increases in cerebral blood flow 
and lactate and also the anaerobic ATP in a specific parts of the brain. So when we have uh, the voxel based studies using the MRS, it turns out that after the AVE, some studies have indicated that the, the dynamics of the chemical shift imaging and the chemical shift dynamics of the, of the specific parts uh, uh, the, of the brain will get a specific changes after you know exposure to AVE. Also, we know that for the the neural transmitter uh, buffering, we have we need to have a good balance. So in the specific parts, uh, the frontal part of the brain or the back of the brain, we need to have a good harmony between some neural transmitters. So this balance between, for example, GABA and serotonin plays a critical part in our mood regulation. And it turns out that some studies have uh, uh, have positive, uh, you know, promising effect of AVE on uh, uh, this balance uh, of the neural transmitter dynamics. Also, from other studies, uh, some some evidence has emerged that we got neuronal excitability and also the increase in glial number. So it, it, it shows that we have this, you know, counter-regulatory effect of the neural inflammation in a in distinct part of the brain when someone is subjected to uh, a stress and worry. And also we have the heat shock protein 70, which is, which is upturned. And we, we, we can see that some specific cytokines and uh, pro-inflammatory mediators like TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, or uh, inflammatory inflammatory cytokines like IL-1, IL-10, and IL-6, and, and so on and so forth, will get modulated when the subjects have uh, been uh, exposed to AVE. So this is pretty much of interest for anyone who is interested to figure out about uh, the good and and the and the possibly appropriate modality to pursue when we're discussing about the neuroscience of uh, you know sensory stimulation. So we have audiovisual stimulation. When when I'm watching the screen of my computer, or when we're watching TV, we have the audiovisual stimulation, right? But it does not necessarily mean that our brain waves are getting entrained with that frequency. So when an exact frequency is delivered, and the, now the frequency has been like derived and extracted from all different chaotic mixed frequency and voltages. So we just extract a specific pattern of the frequency in terms of the frequency band and also the amplitude of the wave. So by this, we know that now we're talking about AVE. So it's something different compared to AVS. And uh, when we have randomized in this and plus minus one hertz, Again, we're going to have the AVE. When we have plus minus two hertz, we have that like an, a borderline effect, which is not necessarily AVE. But when the randomization is plus minus three hertz, then we, we're not specifically talking about uh, the, the distinct range of frequency entrainment. So in this case, we're not anymore talking about uh, the, the AVE. And we cannot expect that this modal modality will will, intu will introduce uh, the, the effects of uh, you know, brainwave entrainment. And what, what exactly refers to uh, this uh, neurophysiological dynamics, it all relates to the, the communication between all the sensory modalities and also the gateways that we have the, the you know, like olfaction, like auditory, like the visual, you know, uh, senses. We have the chemical and somatic senses, all right? So we know that almost all of these senses are passing through the anterior, anterior thalamus. And the thalamus is like a gateway, is the gatekeeper. So it, it just induces uh, all the pathways that are gonna reach the cortex. So we have the, the parietal and we have the acoustic, the visual cortex. So when, when we're going to just kind of entrain this uh, thalamocortical pathways to ensure that the brain has gained the capacity of oscillating or sort of firing in a distinct uh, frequency band or specific common spatial patterns, then by that we can ensure that the brain has kind of been entrained to that sort of stimulation. So if we have the stimulation 
a visual stimulation, which is in the frequency bandwidth of like 10 hertz, then by this we can expect that the cost that the the visual part of the brain, which is which is the occipital cortices, will get entrained uh, when we're talking about like like the 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 isochronic uh, you know a visual stimulation, and also when we're when we're talking about the isochronic acoustic stimulation, again we're talking about the same thing, right? So it all it all relates to how we're going to modulate the thalamic gateway and how we're going to let the brain waves get synchronized with the with the pattern of the of the auditory or visual or whatever stimulation that we're giving to 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 the brain and uh, a little while before just a little, little while ago we we've been discussing about the parasympathetic tone and we're kind of pretty much aware that when we have the down scaling of the parasympathetic tone, then the people will start to have the sympathetic uh, overdrive. And by this, people will not have the, the regulated emotions. They will have like the heart start to race and they have the sweating of the palm. They have like a shortness of breath and they have like panic like attacks uh, every now and then. So this means that the tone or the strength of the parasympathetic uh, those charges is not exactly at we need to have as we need to have it. So by up training the the vagal tone by up training the the parasympathetic uh, you know dynamics then by that we can kind of uh, be expecting that the 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 resilience in in the face of uh, in the face of stressful situations and the load of anxiety and the subjective feeling of anxiety would be dramatically decreased when we have good you know parasympathetic control over those uh, autonomic chain of reactions so yeah when we have also the stimulation with the specific frequency range uh, on the, the lobules or also the tragus of the ears then we have uh, the capacity of stimulating the the retroocular uh, or retrooral uh, chains or branches, retro, yeah, retroolar branches of the uh, vagal nerve. So when this, these are just going all the way back to the to the motor nucleus, posterior nucleus, nucleus of the vagal nerve, which is going to increase the tone of uh, a vagal, you know, activity. And by that, we can expect a better control over the sympathetic overdrive. So for the auditory evoke response to tones, what uh, we can expect that when we have the uh, the stimulus, which has been calibrated as of like 100 clicks per second, which is like 100 hertz, then by that we're, we're, we can literally expect that in the EEG of the acoustic cortex, we can have an increased rate of brain frequency ra uh, range of oscillations and the brain would start to get entrained with this 100 hertz of acoustic oscillation. So by time and by, uh, you know, uh, sequences of sessions, the, the, the EEG will, will potentially get, uh, get entrained with this specific pattern of firing rate. So the brain will kind of learn, right, how to um, oscillate in a whole new way. So by this, the brain, the brain will get increased or decrease in the frequency range uh, of specific brain patterns and oscillations in a distinct part of the cortices. So that's all about the, the AVE. So when we have the monoocular, when we have the monooral beats, then uh, uh, for instance, when we have the left loudspeaker and right loudspeaker, so each of the loudspeakers are introducing uh, the oscillator, a, a separate oscillator for like 170 hertz or 100, 178 hertz, then we have this subtraction and then by that we get the phantom sound which is going to be the subtracted uh, uh, frequency band of the two ears and that will be literally like 8 hertz that will be perceived by the ear. So sometimes we got to be uh, introducing like offset. So by the offset, we can expect that uh, by adding up to the uh, like the band frequency and also the amplitude of the specific frequency range, then we can strengthen the, the given band, 
bandwidth. So by that, when we are giving some sort of the, the phase difference between what we have as a specific frequency range to what we are introdu introducing to the brain, that we can expect that literally or potentially this would increase the amplitude of that specific frequency bandwidth. So this is something which is called uh, phase difference induction or offset that sometimes uh, we can get benefit of that when we're using the binaural or monaural uh, beats in, in terms of uh, acoustic or visual uh, entrainments. So based on one of the research uh, uh, you know st uh, one, one of the studies which has already been published in 2007 we know that, and it, and it was published in cerebral cortex, uh, well, it turns out that the cortical stereo state response to central and peripheral auditory beats have been um, introducing some kind of oscillatory changes in the acoustic areas of the brain. And the acoustic cortices will show whole different uh, you know, patterns of uh, oscillation when the subject has been introduced to binaural beats as compared to the monaural mono beats. So these are something which needs to uh, gain further attention as we're more discussing about the neuroscience research uh, in ABE. So as you see, when we have the off-on-off -off sequence of the, uh, uh, of the visual stimuli, then for the right, right eye, left eye, we have the stimulation. And for each of these stimulation blocks, we have like evoke, evoke related potential for the eye response, okay? And we all know that these, these patterns are going to travel, these potential will travel from the retina to the lateral geniculate body and the lateral geniculate nucleus will transmit all the data to, to the optic radiations and that will eventually lead to the, and that will definitely uh, uh, end up to the, the uh, uh, visual cortex in the back of the brain. So as we, need, uh, as we need to understand all the dynamics of those things, perhaps that would be best to pursue with the uh, ERP studies when we're using the a AVE uh, you know, modulations, then at the same time, we gotta be thinking about the kind of changes that AVE would induce in, uh, in, in functional areas of the, of the auditory or, or of the visual cortex. So these are the studies that already have been uh, you know, in place for the past several years. So the AVE has, as I said before, it has been in place in research um, and, and studies for, for the past several years. And uh, back to 1973, Kenny have been using uh, the entrainment um, for, for um, uh, I mean, the entrainment neurophysiology for checking the, the kind of changes that this AVE induces in uh, the evoke potentials, either uh, the visual or acoustic one. So yeah, coming back to the research, uh, the first emerging uh, uh, evidence came from the studies which have been done by uh, Dr. Siever uh, back in a time like 1997. Uh, Dr. Siever and his colleagues started to figure out that yeah, this audiovisual entrainment will change the EEG profiles of uh, the people who are exposed to this kind of you know uh, stimuli. So we, 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 for example, had a 60 year old female with depression and this has been kind of, you know, uh, this, the pattern of the EEG has been kind of modulated after the, after the entrainment uh, using the AVE device, which was preliminarily developed by um, uh, Dr. Sieber. And they started to see that, yeah, for, for, some specific bandwidths that they are correlated with the dysregulated mood of this of this 60 year old female when we have this AVE by time session by session the person subjectively started to report that yeah my my um, you know depressed mood is getting better session after session and by that when we're referring to this uh, QEG dynamics we we figure out that yeah we have some uh, enhanced uh, current source density for higher frequency bandwidth bandwidths like uh, beta one or beta two or even beta three frequencies at uh, some uh, areas of the brain that they are potentially linked to mood regulations 
of IE, what I'm referring to is the, the frontal and the central and the anterior parietal areas of the cortices. So when we have the frontal central entrainment for beta and even high beta frequency, then the person starts to, to report subjective betterment of uh, uh, you know, mood. And by that, we can also see objectively in a QEEG that something is being changed for better and the, and the neural dynamics in the QEEG that, that we've been referring to is getting, uh, you know, changed. Another example was uh, the EEG profile of an 18-year-old male who presented with anxiety and the pre-AVE entropy for one hertz uh, uh, to, to uh, the whole frequency range uh, analysis of the, uh, the brain waves showed that the person didn't have uh, a good spatial and a spectral distribution of uh, beta and high beta uh, frequency ranges in distinct area, areas of the brain. So, uh, for example, in the frontal central and also the frontal temporal areas that you are mostly involved and implicated in regulation of the mood and anxiety state. So when, when the person received uh, sequential sessions of, of AVE, then the QEG dynamics started to change. And as, as you see here, so you will see that uh, something that we have not been expecting, for example, the SMR, which is the low beta and high alpha frequency, the combination of that started to gain in areas of the brain that we are talking about it, like the frontal central and frontal temporal parts of the brain bilaterally, mainly on the left side. So uh, it, it showed that uh, the, the AVE entropy, uh, the post uh, AVE entrainment has left uh, a dramatic response and dramatic change of modulation in the QEEG wave patterns in uh, re respected areas of the brain that you're implicated in the regulation of mood and anxiety. Also, uh, when the frequency of uh, like uh, theta band, like four to six hertz, have been introduced by specific modules because we are a little, a little uh, a while further, we'll be discussing about the, the, the device, which is already uh, available in neuroscience centers and also in the market. People can use it under care of a physician or um, like a, a, a neural healthcare provider. It, it is called the AVE machine. So we have the AVE device and we're, when we're put in the device, we have different modules. So many of these modules are pre-programmed. Uh, in, in some instances, the, the clinician or the neural scientist may need to define uh, or program a specific module as per the need for that person. For example, if I'm a person is coming to your door and I'm complaining about the lack of concentration and you're going to apply AVE for me based on my baseline QEEG, you as a neural scientist may decide upon how you're going to uh, uh, design the protocol and the, the audiovisual entrainment. Are you going to apply the, the vagal nervous stimulation, as I said, like the retroaural uh, uh, you know, branches of the vagal nerve? Are they going to be stimulated as well? Is the stimulation going to be like a pulsatile way or that's going to be continuous? Yeah, how, um, how, how strong would be the, the stimulation? I mean, uh, what is the amplitude of the of the of the auditory, visual, or electrical stimulation? I mean, uh, the, the 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 stimulation that I'm going to introduce. How strong is that supposed to be? And also, uh, what what is the the sequence of the thing? Are they going to be delivered all together, or we just have the acoustic, or we just have the visual, or we just need to have the the CES or the vagal nerve stimulation (VNS)? Is the probe of the VNS supposed to be placed on the tragus or on the ear lobule? These are the questions to be, uh, uh, you know, um, answered when a neuroscientist is trying to uh, design a protocol for that. And yeah, the visual uh, uh, stimulation is uh, as per a patented through and vu eye set field independent stimulation which is, uh, I, we are going to make a demonstration of that, a live demo at the end of the session. So we are, you're using this uh, specific goggles and then the back and the inner side of the goggles, we have some LEDs. So the LED, LEDs are producing specific patterns of flashes of light and the light flashes would be in, uh, in different colors. So we have two different patterns uh, 
of flashing. One is 4 hertz and one is 12 hertz, 12 hertz, hertz. And these are going to be alternatively displacing. So 12 hertz, when, when it's on, then the 4 hertz is off. So vice versa, when we have the 4 hertz on, then the 12 hertz is off. So this goes on and on, and we have the B plus B, like, which is going to be, uh, you know, adding on effect to produce a, a whole strengthening effect of the 4 hertz, uh, you know, oscillation. And this is, this is when we're, uh, you know, stimulating the, uh, the, the visual cortices and the visual cortical risp response by the 4 hertz, and the 4 hertz will get heightened, will get increased, will get strengthened. But for the other block of the stimulation, we got like 12 hertz stimulated. And this 12 and 4 hertz are alternatively uh, being introduced to the subject as, this, as long as the subject is placing, is putting on the goggles and uh, undergoing the session. So yeah, when uh, it, it has been shown that when we're using this, because for many of the cases, when we have the slow alpha, which is predominating in the frontal part of the, parts of the brain, the people may start to uh, complain about the, the lack of attention. So in attentiveness, in attentiveness, in the people who are uh, having attention, uh, you know, deficit disorders, even in the adults, uh, kind of, you know, in some ways correlate with the the gain of the low alpha frequency ampl and amplitude in the frontal parts of the cortices. So when we're using this, uh, you know, uh, visual entrainments using uh, the uh, the 12 hertz uh, oscillating with 4 hertz, and that is being introduced to the uh, retino uh, retinopalamic uh, pathways and also the thalamocortical pathways, and that start to kind of entrain the visual cortex, then the, then the person start to have, because we all know that we have the lateral occipital complex and prefrontal or frontal polar uh, area. So LOC, FP, is like a network that cross correlate and cross links the occipital part of the brain to the frontal part of the brain. So when we have this oscillation in the, in the bandwidth of alpha, then the person start to have this entrainment uh, not only in the visual cortex, but also in the frontal part of the brain. So by that, the person will start to have uh, gain in the alpha amplitude. So the predominant beta in the frontal part of the brain will get decreased and the person will not have uh, continued symptoms of, of hyperactivity or attention deficits, right? And uh, when it comes to binaural beat uh, research, uh, one of the studies which has captured our attention was uh, a relatively bigger study which was done on 104 patients undergoing general anesthesia for surgery. And uh, when people were listening to music with binaural beats, their anxiety turns, turned out to be decreased by 26%. And the p-value compared to the control was like less than uh, 0 0.001. On the other hand, when patients listen to the music without BAB, then we expected, as expected, the, the, the level of decrease in anxiety was lower. It was like 11%. And with the people like the control group were not, exp were, were not exposed to the BAB or the binaural beat or nothing, then uh, they had the least decrease in their anxiety. anxiety. So they had like 3.8% decrease in their anxieties. So by this, in a relatively good number of patients, uh, the, the authors have concluded that uh, uh, the binaural beat uh, before uh, the, uh, the, the anesthesia will decrease the anxiety of the people who are undergoing the surgery by up to 25% or even more, all right? So why we think that this is something readily accessible? Why we need to go and tap into more research in AVE? Because that's cheap. That's very, you know, reasonably uh, accessible. That is available. It's easily available. It's downloadable. Many of these, you know, visual or acoustic pre-programmed softwares or applications, mobile applications, they are readily available and they are easy to download. It is cost effective and the cost generally ranges from like free of charge or $20 per, uh, 
per file. So it's, it's kind of reasonably priced so people can use it. And, and it's portable. We can use that in our gadgets. We can use our mobile phones or iPads or smartphones. And we can, uh, we can simply, you know, install the applications we're using, uh, who are use, which, is you, which are used for introduction of uh, uh, this, um, uh, you know, acoustic or visual entrainments. And they can also use decreasing the anxiety level, increasing the attention for the betterment of the memory function, even for, uh, uh, you know, easier and better sleep. So these are all the different applications that we are readily available. And uh, they are rooting in a plethora of research. And it, it's like a sensory and it's like a behavioral neuroscience research that have been accumulating for the past couple of decades. So if someone is interested, uh, just go and do a simple internet search. Just punch, you know, the word relaxation audios using isochronic tone in Google or whatever searching engine. And uh, you can also use the hemisync.com. You can uh, use the eoinstitute.org, which is one of the most famous platforms for of the, the, the audiovisual entrainment, um, you know, pre-programmed softwares or applications. And we can also use the, the phone apps, including the Brainwave Tuner or Brain Booster. Just go to the App Store and then, or your Google Play and can simply download all those specific apps. So yeah, here, uh, I just want to draw your attention to a model that why we are thinking and we're kind of, you know, uh, hypothesizing that using the AVE would enhance the brain functionality, brain functionality and our functional harmony. So we've recently developed the model for the inclusive brain health. And we know that, first of all, our neural system is composed of CNS, ANS and PNS. So if you look at the black triangle, you see that there is like a harmony, a center of gravity between the different angles of this triangle. So CNS needs to be in close contact and harmony and regulated by the, the ANS, ANS with PNS and PNS with CNS. So when we're discussing about the, the balance and the harmony and the well-regulated functionality in the whole um, you know, uh, uh, neural system, then we gotta be thinking about the, uh, the, the, the cross correlation and also the balance between the CNS, ANS, PNS, number one. Number two is the red circle. So imagine that we have around our head like a 360 degrees circle, right? So the first half of this circle is devoted to our behavior. How we're going to counteract, how we're going to, you know, uh, just uh, interact with the uh, with the environment and how the inter and how the environment affects uh, ourselves. So that's sort of you know define that would sort of define our behavior. So the impact of the environment on us and impact and, and the reaction that we have on the environment is kind of related to our uh, uh, behavioral dynamics. So if you go to the back half of this circle, then you have the emotional right side. So when we're talking about the emotion regulation, the affective health. And when we have the, the cognitive health or cognitive fitness of all the different domains like attention, memory, learning, and uh, you know, verbal fluency, working memory, uh, judgment, reasoning, planning, and decision making, and sequential ordering, and also the motor uh, performance, and uh, the executive functions, and you know all. So these are all related to our cognitive domains. So when we're discussing the, the neural functionality and also the whole, you know, uh, 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 what I, neurodynamics, if you want to put it like that. Uh, it all relates to how the circle is, is harmonized, how we have those behavior and cognition and emotion uh, well balanced. So the third thing is the, the, uh, the, 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 like the green square. And you see that the green square is like, uh, encompassing and all different things that we've been discussing each other are uh, are encompassing each other. So the, 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 the green triangle refers to the environmental stress. Also what we have is the uh, like the allostatic stress load 
and on the right side we have the genetic profile and we have also the sleep and wakefulness on the down left corner of this triangle uh, of this square on the right side we have the nutrition and also the physical activity all right so these are also the dynamics that we have in an, in terms of our correlation in terms of our links with the environment so the the, the brain environment interactions and these are the links and last but not least we have this inside out outside in concept or domain we have the inverted yellow triangle and one of the one of the you know parts we have the brain and the other angle we have the body and at the third angle we have the surrounding so question is why we're putting all this inclusive aspects of brain functionality and brain health together because when we are using this uh, a whole uh, area of uh, brain health which is called inclu inclusive brain health model then we need to just sort of mobilize our brain predicaments or functional predicaments maybe that is uh, like you know motor or neurofunctional predicaments someone has stroke and after that he's not able to move or is not able to speak or whatever the person has got like uh, affective predicaments when a person has a range of different emotional dysregulation and also dysphoria is like uh, like uh, anxiety depression PTSD uh, or OCD and specific phobias general phobias or whatever so these are like the emotional and affective dysregulations and when we have cognitive predicaments uh, we have another space of dysregulation so we have three spaces of mental impairments or mental ailments one is a space one and s1 is the neurofunctional uh you know domain of uh of uh, uh impairments so when we have s1 we we are talking about some kind of neurofunctional impairments when we have s2 we're talking about the affective dysregulation and when we have the s3 or the space 3 we're discussing about the the cognitive impairments so the center of gravity for all those geometric shapes is the just the very center of this of the, of the slide here and that's the s4 or the space 4 what is a space 4 space 4 is a space that I'm not suffering from neurofunctional or affective or a cognitive impairment so that's the best state of or the optimal state of our brain functionality so our aim our goal is to use the neurotechnology such as AVE or uh, uh, or uh, electrical stimulation of the brain or we have the uh, uh, you know the thermoregulation or, it, um, or we have the uh, the magnetic stimulation and we have the cognitive rehabilitation therapy we have the uh, you know uh, sensory modulation what so uh, you know whatever we're talking about as a neurotechnological tools our aim is to sort of mobilize people from space one neurofunctional deficits or space two effective derangement effective dysregulation or space three which is cognitive impairment to space four so what we are all trying to do is to stimulate is to st entrain is to modulate the cortical and subcortical brain areas to help the person gain better capacity of uh, of uh, using the brain networks because we know that we we we, we have around uh, more than more than 10 uh, larger scale brain networks and when it come into harmony then the person will start to have uh, a feeling of uh, mental health or well-being and uh, the thing that we're all pursuing right so yeah the audiovisual entrainment has got a device so we have the light and sound stimulation and we use the glasses that these glasses are producing flashes of light at a specific frequency as was said before we have the the tones in the headphone at the same frequency and also we got the brain wave which are matching the frequencies uh, uh, of the of the uh, sensory stimulation so that this is the thing this is the main concept that we've been referring to as entrainment and that might be increasing or decreasing the arousal and stability of the cortices so we we can excite or we can we can suppress and we can inhibit a specific cortical hops using this this uh, audiovisual frequencies uh, stimulation or or suppressions 
So this is an example of one of the uh, commercially available devices in the market. This is an audiovisual entrainment device that uh, it's composed of a goggle. And, and the back in the interface of the goggle, we have a, a, a set and array of LEDs, and they are producing flashes of lights in different colors. And we have the uh, the headphone, and the headphone is they are all you know linked to a central unit. So if I'm going to show you one of those things, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was my bad. I'm sorry. All right, we're good. So if I'm going to show you uh, one of the models. Uh, of the, the commercially available AE, AVE devices that they are currently available in the market. Uh, that's called the Dave um, or the David Delight or David Pro. And that is also originally developed by, by Dave Safer. And uh, it has been developed by the Mind Alive company and another company which is called Pharmed is uh, introducing that in, in our local market in Iran and maybe in your home countries you have the local distributors of the Mind Alive in Canada. So anyway, this is something that um, uh, referred to as the, the visual entrainment part of the whole device. So that's the goggle. And as you see in the interface of that, we have a range of, which is, which is like an inbuilt array of the LEDs here. And when the person just puts on this, when, when we have the pre-programmed module, then the specific range of the uh, you know, flashlight uh, stimulation will start to be submitted and the person will, will start to gain the entrainment, entrainment uh, with respect to the visual stimulation. And, all, and the acoustic is the same. So uh, we, we're putting on this and then we have the specific range of the frequency entrainments that already been planned in, in the given modules or now uh, we're going to plan about it. So the neural scientist may, may define a module or we may refer to as the central unit. So this is the central unit of the device. And my colleague in a short while, we're gonna demonstrate how this works and we're gonna show you how we're going to use different modules to, to, to uh, you know, induce this uh, stimulation uh, audiovisual entrainments. And uh, yeah, so there are, range of different studies showing the effects and also the practicality of audio versus visual entrainment. So we know that if we're using the eyes closed and eyes open, uh, uh, acoustic stimulation and visual stimulation at the same time, then the range of entrainment and the gain in the amplitude of a given frequency, for example, 18.5 Hertz, will be higher if the eyes are closed and photic entrainment is given and also at the same time, when we have the eyes open and auditory entrainment is given, it's like 27 gain in the amplitude of the 18.5 Hertz EEG. But when the eyes is closed, when the eyes are closed and we have the auditory entrainment by 18.5 Hertz, then we have an increase in the amplitude of this by 21%. So it shows that when we have the eyes closed and the photic entrainment is being delivered, then the, the main, uh, the, I mean, the most expectation we can have for entrainment of the, of the brain oscillation in specifically more predominantly in the visual cortices. So, yeah, and studies have shown that people who are using this AVE devices start to feel uh, that when they have this racing mind phenomenon, they have the mind chatter and they have restless, irritable, uh, you know, mind state. So when you're using this after one or two sessions, they start to feel and they, they you know, uh, report that they have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, mental chatter or this, uh, you know, racing mind phenomenon has been uh, dramatically decreased. And uh, also they might, in some rare cases, they might have the, uh, uh, some uh, re subjective reports of compute confusion. And when specifically we're overloading the subjects with the uh, AV uh, stimulation or AV entrainment. So we need to be cautious about the duration of the sessions. And it is it has already been pre-programmed in the, in the central unit. But in specific cases, when we are designing the, the module, we got to be cautious about the duration of the time that we're given this session. And uh, yeah, so it, it's critical to choose the frequency band in a specific uh, band frequency as we're uh, going to address, uh, you know, distinct uh, 
people or the or patients that are coming with a specific complex to our to our facility. For example, someone who is complaining about the ADHD, for like, for example, like a young kid, uh, we need to be aware of stimulating the frontal part of the brain and also the, the occipital frontal networks using the beta frequency ranging from 14 to 30 hertz. Alpha, uh, which ranges from 8 to 13 hertz, it's used to induce the deep down relaxation experience or we are using for that for deep relaxation or mindfulness and stuff like that or theta is uh, generally used for forming new habits or repressing memories and also uh, maybe it is used for the people who are primarily complaining about insomnia and delta is also used when the people are finding it difficult to get down to sleep. So when we're using delta oscillation to help the people uh, decrease their sleep latency. Uh, when we have the dual, you know, stimulation, left and right hemisphere or against field stimulation, passive non-entraining and repetitive sessions, then they mi we might be expecting a, a differential effect of the, of the mixture of all those uh, brainwave entrainments. So it's a long story, but to cut it short, what I can say is that when we are uh, confronting a patient or, or, a, or a client coming to us and asking for assistance or help with respect to, for example, his or her worry. For example, this adult woman is coming to her practice and she, is expl and she, is, she has been uh, complaining about excessive worry and anxiety and a strong, overwhelming emotional reactions. So when we have the quantitative EEG and we do the FFT and we have the quantitative uh, you know, uh, analysis of the brain waves, we can see that the beta activity and uh, high beta activity, I mean, by activity, I mean the, the amplitude, the microvolts, uh, the, the power of beta and high beta. Uh, when we have like 19 channel QEG recording, what we, we can uh, see that of all those areas of the brain are showing a high level of uh, beta activity, but it's not, it is, it is not, uh, uh, it, it shouldn't be necessarily the case because we can cross correlate this objective finding to subjective feeling of excessive worry. So what we need to do is to down train the beta frequency specifically in the frontal central part of the brain. And this is what happened after uh, entrainment. So when we are using the neurofeedback and also AVE, because we can combine the, the neurotechnological modules, for example, we can use the biofeedback ter therapy together with AVE. We can use the, the transcranial electrical stimulation or TES with AVE. We can use the, the mixture of uh, uh, TES, AVE and biofeedback and also meditation even. So we can put them all together. It, de it depends on how you're going to formulate this package for a given need of, of, uh, of a specific subject coming to your facility. So by this, this scenario has been referred to uh, a combination of neurofeedback therapy and AVE, which has been um, shown to increase the alpha uh, power in given areas of the brain cortices and also decreasing the beta, which has been, um, you know, subjectively and objectively ended up with uh, decreased um, anxiety and regulated mood. In practice, we're using this uh, AVE technology and AVE or audiovisual entrainment setup for relaxation training, for passive or neurofeedback or brain-based geometric meditation, if you like, or brain-based meditation, or sometimes we're using this for, uh, uh, for like mindfulness practices to decrease the mental uh, uh, overload in terms of anxiety or, or uh, thought rumination. For the people who've got problems in learning for LD cases or the, or the young kids uh, who are coming with or presenting with ADHD, then one of the main application of AVE could be down training the beta activity in the frontal part of the brain and also to increase the, uh, the beta oscillations and beta power in the prefrontal areas of the brain, specifically on the left area. So this is what we exactly uh, expecting to happen after a series of sessions of AVE. For depression, for anxiety, autism spectrum disorder, for seasonal affective, for temporomandibular joint disorder, TMJ problems, for chronic pain 
and for fibromyalgia, but, and many other examples. So if you're just tapping into a whole range of research and studies which has already been which is a, which has a, which have already been done for uh, AVE and its a therapeutic and modulating effect on different uh, neurological or mental or psychiatric problems, we can see some cumulative uh, uh, you know set of evidence which is kind of backing up the the hypothesis that AVE would potentially help people to get rid of many of those derangements. Uh, as, as they are getting in trained in time. So yeah, we can also be thinking of using the AVE as our future perspectives in, re, in our uh, you know, upcoming research. We can think of uh, applying this for enhancing the verbal skills of the people who have got stuttering, the people who are suffering from uh, you know, a verbal developmental delay. I mean, the, the prelingual cases, the people, uh, the, 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 the young children that they have problem with uh, verbal development. Also for attention deficits, either in adults with ADD or in, in children with ADHD. Uh, people who start to have problem and they start to complain uh, of, uh, about the, the lack of memory or a decline in their cognitive function. And also their stress and anxiety, the pain and the, and the disorganized behavior in children. So there are lots of different domains that we can potentially apply AVE to, uh, to see if that is practically going to help people get rid of those predicaments. Another study has shown that it was published in 2016. It has demonstrated uh, the beneficial effects of AVE on um, uh, the, the academic worry in the college students. So 113 college students, which were divided into four groups, and they were exposed to worry and expressive writing. And then uh, they were given the AVE. Some of them were not. Some of them were just the control group. And uh, uh, each of the groups were, were going under the practice for three times a week. And the worry exposure and the, uh, and the AVE showed significant uh, improvement in all measures compared to the other groups where this was not a case in the control group, okay? Uh, so this is the, 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 the general, you know, uh, outfit <laughs> of the device, which is called, uh, that's the appearance of the AVE, the David Delight Pro. Um, we got, uh, we have already started some research projects using this in different aspects of the uh, neurocognitive and emotional dysregulations and something. People are coming to the brain health centers where this is potentially going to be a value perhaps for uh, the cognitive empowerment. The people who are not necessarily suffering from any neurocognitive disorders, but they want to get improved. They, they want to get even enhanced or empowered. For example, you, we, we got a university professor. He got to have his verbal skills improved. We got a judge and he, was, he wants to, he needs to have his decision-making capacity even empowered. And we have an athlete who's got the need to increase and empower his strength and speed and precision in sport and athletic performance and so on. So uh, you, you can name it. So whatever we would like to change and modulate in terms of the brain functionality, this kind of devices and many other similar sort of devices that they are in any ways are, are used to entrain and sort of enhance the brain dynamics and neural dynamics in the brain cortical areas. This can be potentially used for research and also for clinical service provision. We need to be very you know, aware and pretty much uh, cautious about the fact that not necessarily all different frequency ranges and all different stimulation modalities have undergone evidence-based data. We do not have evidence-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of convincing evidence for them. So they need to have this, uh, uh, you know, reconfirmation from the, from the evidence-based medicine and empirical research, well-designed studies in the future to, to let us, uh, you know, just, you know, rest assured if we're going to use this kind of modality for the people, either healthy subjects who are seeking for empowerment or uh, the people who are coming to a practice suffering from a range of different neurological or psychiatric or cognitive ailments. Yeah, 
So we have different ranges of, uh, uh, if you see this, uh, I don't know if you can see that from here, but there are some kind of pre-programmed modules that they are there and the front face of, uh, of this um, David Delight Pro machine. And uh, we have some symbols and, and the top table here, you can see the symbols. So the symbols are, uh, tar are targeting different frequency entrainment uh, objectives and they are and you can just adjust the device for for any specific frequency range or a specific pre-programmed module so the first one refers to energizing effect of the 20 hertz oscillation the second one is the left-sided uh, stimulation uh, for 9.5 hertz and right stimulation for 10 10.5 then the phantom, you know, oscillation, the phantom uh, wave will be like one hertz. So that is practically in the in the band frequency of delta range, which is used for common effect uh, of meditation. And also we have the brain boosting effect. So when, when someone is uh, concerned about the lack of memory or attention or difficulty in learning new ideas or something, then based on that, we can apply 14 versus 20 hertz based on that the subtracted phantom frequency from 14 to 20 hertz of audio and visual entrainment will uh, end up with uh, like a 6 hertz frequency frequency bandwidth which is in the in the band frequency uh, of uh, theta activity and we all know that theta activity is specifically in the le in the left uh, temporal cortices are are direct directly related to the learning capacity and also the memory function so memory uh, uh, you know, uh, capacity and also the, the, the memory function, specifically working memory, uh, partly depends on the, uh, the, the, the coherence of the theta activity in front of temporal areas. And mainly in the, mainly in the temporal area, when we have an enhanced uh, uh, power of uh, theta frequency uh, range, then we can expect a better uh, cognitive function and people who are, start, who are just, who've just started to have a cognitive decline. So another module is for uh, for sleep. So uh, we can uh, induce the left stimulation 7.8 and right for 8.2, and then we have less than one, uh, you know, uh, frequency oscillation and entrainment, which is in the low band of uh, delta activity. And when people want to go to bed when you're using this specific AVE module, then many of them, according to the evidence base published evidence, uh, we know that many of them start to feel drowsy or they find it less difficult to fall down sleep. And for, for the mood regulation, when people start to have uh, a better feeling, they have like 10 and 20 hertz in the right and left stimulation. So you see this differential stimulation with the phantom frequency that the brain will perceive at the end of the day. So person will, will, will realize that like a 10 hertz oscillation is the dominant frequency when people undergo this uh, stimulation modules. So they will start to have the, the overall feeling of uh, uh, the good feeling like the SMR because when we know that we're talking when we're talking about the high uh, alpha and low beta oscillation when when we have the SMR sensory motor rhythm predominantly uh, you know distributed in the frontal central part of the brain of the prefrontal cortices then mainly on the left side then the subject will start to subjectively report that yeah I'm feeling much better and I'm not overwhelmed about the, all the worries and all the you know disturbing uh, anxiety that I used to have. So it, it is really going to work for many cases. And in practice, what we all depend on is the evidence-based medicine. And that's all I'm going to tap in. I, I was just going to tell you about. So we have this uh, uh, modules. We know all the all the parameters, all the variables that they have been well defined in the manuals of the devices, in all the literature. You have the meditation effect of the AVE. You might be thinking about the brain booster effect of the AVE. That when we're 
when we're going to focus on the SMR beta training or SMR for reading and learning effect, or when we have the ADD and learning, then we're going to choose a specific, uh, you know, module. So the brain booster has already been predefined, it's already been pre-programmed. But we as a neural scientist, as the behavioral therapists or cognitivists, when we're using the AVE devices, when we have the general understanding how the brain works, and we're gonna modulate with the, because that's a teamwork, right? So we, we sit together, we discuss, and we're going to decide about the best modulation program. And by that, we're going to apply a specific frequencies and, and audiovisual entrainment, either from the visual or from the acoustic roots. And the, by that, we're going to entrain the, the specific brain uh, frequency to help a better gain in terms of fun functionality or cognitive or behavioral regulation. So for the, uh, I mean, mood regulation also, we have the predefined program here, but still we can use the sub delta or we can use uh, the, the, like an alpha oscillation. We, we might be extending up to deep delta, alpha relaxation and all different aspects for the sleep also because sleep has been my initial field of practice and I've been my, it's been my focus for the past 10, 15 years. And it has really captured my attention. It's, it was, it was really captivating idea to me that perhaps we're going to use the audiovisual entrainment for the betterment of sleep experience of the people coming from uh, different ranges of sleep problems because we, you know that we have more than 80 types of sleep disorders and some of the sleep problems and mainly insomnias are, are categorized as psychophysiological insomnia. So we have the arousal instability in the cortical call hops of uh, the brain and we do not have any justification why the brain has this level of arousability. So when we entrain the brain function using these devices, using this you know, neural, dyna neural dynamic changes with the application of neurotechnology, then we can expect some changes in the, uh, all different bioparameters of sleep and this might be uh, helping the people to gain a better experience for uh, their, uh, let me, for their sleep experience, I was, I was telling. Uh, well, let me just uh, stop sharing this. So I'm already done with my presentation. We got around like 10 minutes for comments and questions and answers if you have. I'll be very, very happy to hear about your comments. And if you have something to share, I'd be more than pleased to uh, tackle your questions and be of any assistance. But I'm sure that you have good ideas and you have something to add to what I've already been uh, sharing with you. So I'll be very interested to hear from you. And the session is yours. Everybody, do you hear me? Excuse me.